I am Dionysus, the child of Zeus, and I have come to this land of the Thebans where Cadmus's daughter Semele once bore me, delivered by a lightning blast. Having assumed a mortal form in place of my divine one, I am here at the fountains of Dirce and the water of Ismenos. Here near the palace, I see the tomb of my thunder-stricken mother and the remains of her abode, smoldering with the still living flame of Zeus's fire. Hera's everlasting outrage against my mother. I praise Cadmus, who made this place hallowed, the shrine of his daughter, which now I have covered all around with the cluster bearing grapevine. I have left the rich lands of the Lydians and Phrygians, the sunny plains of the Persians and the walls of Bactria, passing over the harsh lands of the Medes, the fertile Arabia, and all of Asia, which lies along the coast of the sea, its beautifully towered cities replete with a mixture of Hellenes and barbarians. In Hellenic territory, I have come here to Thebes first, already having established my choruses and mysteries in those other lands, so that I might be a daemon manifest among mortals, and have raised my cry here, fitting a fawn skin to my body, and taking a sacred wand in my hand, a dart of ivy. For my mother's sisters, the very ones for whom it was least becoming, claimed that I was not a child of Zeus, but that Semele had conceived a child from a mortal father and then blamed her sexual misconduct on Zeus, Cadmus's plot, for which reason they claimed that Zeus killed her, because she had told a false tale about her marriage. Therefore, have I driven them from the house with frenzy, and they dwell in the mountains out of their minds. And I have given them the compulsion to wear the outfit of my mysteries. All the female offspring of the house of Cadmus, as many as are women, I have made to leave the house with madness. And they mingle with the sons of Cadmus, sit on roofless rocks beneath green pines. It is necessary that this city learn, even though it should not wish to, that it is not an initiate of my Bacchic rites, and that I plead the case of my mother, Semele, and making myself manifest to mortals as a daemon whom she bore to Zeus. Cadmus then gave his office and his tyranny to Pentheus, his daughter's son, who fights against the gods in my person and drives me away from treaties, never making mention of me in his prayers, for which reason, I will show him and all the Thebians that I am a god. And when I have arranged the situation here to my satisfaction, I will move to another land, revealing myself. But if ever the city of Thebes should in anger seek to drive the Bacchae down from the mountains with arms, I, leading on my Maenads, will join them in battle. For these reasons, I have assumed a mortal form altering my shape into the nature of a man, my sacred band, you women who have left Tmolos, the bullock of Lydia, whom I have brought from among the barbarians as assistants and companions for myself, raise up your kettle drums, the native instruments of the city of Phrygians, the invention of Mother Rhea and myself, and going about the palace of Pentheus, beat them so that Cadmus's city might see. I myself will go off to the folds of Kitharion, where the Bacchae are, and will join in their chorus. That was Tony Jawardena voicing the character Dionysus at the beginning of Euripides' play, The Bacchae. Thank you and welcome. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with the Center for Hellenic Studies, the Cosmos Society, and some actors I'd like to that you get introduced to later, including Janet Spencer Turner, Richard Neal, Vince Brimble, Paula Mahoney, Nicole Bird, and Sarah Finnegan. We're also joined today by Timothy Moore from Washington University in St. Louis. So Euripides' play, The Bacchae, is a play that takes tragedy back to its beginnings 
even as it's written near the end of an era. One of the most interesting things about this play is that tragedy itself uh, develops in the context of Athenian ritual. But this play seems to have been written outside of Athens in, Mac in Macedon after Euripides left the city in 408 BCE. And it wasn't until after his death that the play was performed probably around 406 or 405 BCE, as Athens itself was coming to the end of the long Peloponnesian War. And this play is one of those plays that challenges and befuddles almost everybody who encounters it. At its start, and one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that this was one of the first plays we talked about, is that the play is about contagion. But it's not about the type of contagion we're dealing with today. It's about the more dangerous kind, and that's the contagion of ideas the way that language and ritual and human practice moves like a wildfire from one place to another, and it can carry with it good ideas and bad ones too. The story you just heard from Dionysus is centering us. It does the job at the beginning of the play of sort of tuning us into where we are in the story because Dionysus is a character of many different faces. He is the patron deity of tragedy and of taking different forms and different shapes. And so you never know what you're going to get. And Euripides centers us in the beginning of his tale at Thebes. So neither where he's writing in the North or in where it's been performed in Athens. And the play as it's on its own unfolds in different ways. You could say it's about power. It's about rhetoric. It's about identity. In the middle, we see some scenes where it's really about theater and meta theater itself, uh, about human society. And it's also about the history of the genre and why we perform this and how important it is in Athens. But here we'll start with the story itself. Dionysus was born in Thebes. He was rejected by his family and he left. And we get back to the conventional story of Dionysus traveling back from the East and enforcing his rule where it's possible. Now, one of the things we're investigating in this series is how to perform tragedy in the modern age. And one of the things that we often forget when we're reading this in the classroom or alone is that tragedy was a music and dance extravaganza. So one of the reasons we're happy to have Tim Moore with us today is to talk about that as aspect of it. Because one of the strangest things about reading choral odes and tragedy is it's like taking a pop song, ripping it from its rhythm and its music and its context and just reading the words. So Dionysus comes on stage, he announces himself, he gives his story, and then the chorus takes over. And I'm hoping Tim can tell us a little more about that chorus and get us in a more Dionysian mood. Thank you, Joel, and thank you all of you for your fine readings. As you mentioned, the Greek tragedy is very much a musical form, and that music often reflects and expresses much of what the tragedies are about. And I think nowhere is this truer than in the Bacchae. Joel mentioned that the tragedy is much about contagion, and that contagion can seem dangerous. That contagion is often unclear just whether it's a good or a bad thing. And perhaps we see that best in the music and the choruses of the Bacchae. The title of the play, after all, is Bacchae, which is the women following Bacchus. And as we just saw, uh, was read, he said, he's, Dionysus said, he's going off where the Bacchae are. Well, those are the women of Thebes, off in the hills. But this title, Bacchae, is probably from another group of Bacchae, the ones that he's calling upon right now a set of women who have followed him from Asia and make up the chorus of the play. They express through most of the play the great joy that can come with Dionysus, the glories of this contagion of the ideas and emotions coming with Dionysus. And they do that very well musically. They come on singing the praises of Dionysus, singing about his birth in the opening song of the play, the Parodos, and as they do, they're accompanied by an instrument called a tibia, or aulos in Greek, which is basically like two oboes being played together. Sounds a little bit like a combination of a clarinet and an oboe and a bagpipe. That's played along, along with a percussion instrument called a tympanon, which is like a tambourine, but without the jingles. It's a round drum. And we can picture that raspy woodwind instrument playing being accompanied periodically at regular intervals, probably by this tympanum. As they do that, 
They sing a rhythm that I like to call the Texas two-step of ancient Greek rhythms. It's called ionic rhythm. And like a Texas two-step, it's short, short, long, long, short, short, long, long. And any of you have danced in a bar in Texas know that that rhythm is both joyful and mesmerizing, perhaps accompanied by the tympanum. If we listen to the first few verses of the Paradox, we can get a sense of this joyful, mesmerizing music that is being expressed throughout much of this play. Thank you for that. I definitely could not replicate it, um, uh, but it would be interesting to spend some time in some Texas uh, ice houses with you, Tim. Um, uh, both Tim and I used to teach in Texas, so we have that background there. Um, Moving from Texas to Thebes, the chorus continues to perform. And you know, in the original performance, the chorus would have been 50 men and boys or some admixture, um, just a huge spectacle. And they perform in honor of Dionysus, disguised as, as these women, um, and they sing his praises. And then they leave the main stage, well, they're never on it in the ancient world. And we get to see two famous people from Theban myth, the prophet Tiresias, and Cadmus, and they come on stage to discuss uh, what is happening to them and what will happen. And um, they introduce a pretty common European um, technique, which is to bring figures who might not belong together onto the same stage. Cadmus is a legendary founder of Thebes, and Tiresias is a prophet who shows up in the Oedipus plays and in Homer's Odyssey. So Tiresias and Cadmus. Who is at the gates? Call from the house Cadmos, son of Aegina, who left the Sidonian city and fortified this city of the Thebans with towers. Let someone go and announce that Tiresias is looking for him. He knows why I have come and what agreement I, an old man, have made with him, older yet, to twine the sacred wands, to wear fawn skins and to crown our heads with ivy shoots. Most near and dear. From in sound, inside the house, I heard and recognized your wise voice, the voice of a wise man, and have come with this equipment of the God. To the best of our abilities, we must extol him, the child of my daughter. Where is it necessary the chorus where must we put our feet and shake our grey heads? Lead me, an old man, Tiresias, old, for you are wise. And so I would not tire night or day, striking the ground with the sacred wand. Gladly I have forgotten that we are old. And then you and I are experiencing the same thing, for I too feel young and will try to join the chorus. We'll go to the mountain in a chariot. But in this way, the god would not have equal honours. I, an old man, will lead you like a pupil, though you are an old man. The god will lead us there without ordeal. Are we the only ones in the polis who will join the chorus in his honor. We alone are sensible, all the others foolish. Delay is love. Take hold of my hand. Here, take hold and join your hand with mine. Having been mortal, I do not scorn the gods. In the eyes of the Daimoness, we mortals do not act with wisdom. Our ancestral traditions, which we have held throughout our lives, no argument will overturn, not even if something wise should be discovered by the depths of our thinking. Will anyone say that I, who am about to join the chorus with my head covered in ivy, do not respect old age? 
for the God has made no distinction as to whether it is right for men, young or old, to join the chorus, but wishes to have honours and be extolled equally by all, setting no one apart. See the light of the sun here, Tiresias. I will be for you a spokesman about what is happening. Pentheus, child of Echion, to whom I have given control of the is coming here to the house now in all haste. He quivers with excitement. What new matter will he tell us? I was away from this land when I heard of the new evils throughout this city, that our women have left our homes in contrived Bacchic rites and rush about in the shadowy mountains, honoring with choruses this new daemon, Dionysus, whoever he is. I hear the mixing bowls stand full in the midst of their assemblies and that each woman flying to secrecy in different directions yields to the embrace of men on the pretext that they are maenads worshipping. They consider Aphrodite of greater priority than Dionysus. Servants keep as many of them as I have caught in the public buildings with their hands chained. I will hunt from the mountains all of the missing. I know an agave who bore me at Echion, an Ortono, the mother of Acteon, and having bound them in iron fetters, I will soon make them stop this criminal Bacchic activity. They say that a certain Xenos has come, a sorcerer from the Lydian land with the locks of his tawny hair smelling sweetly, having in his eyes the wine dark graces of Aphrodite. He stays with the young girls during the evenings and nights, alluring them with joyful mysteries. If I catch him within this house, by cutting his head from his body, I will stop him from beating his sacred wand and shaking his hair. That's the man who claims that Dionysus is a god. That's the man who claims that Dionysus was once stitched into the thigh of Zeus. Dionysus, who was in reality burnt along with his mother by the flame of lightning because she had falsely claimed to have married Zeus. Is this not worthy of a terrible death by hanging that he, whoever this Xenos is, commits such acts of outrage? But here is another wonder. I see the seer Tiresias clothed in dappled fawn skins along with my mother's father. A great absurdity, raging around with a sacred wand. I want to deny that I see your old age devoid of sense. Won't you cast away the ivy? Will you not? Father of my mother, free your hand of the sacred wand. You urge these things, Tiresias. Do you wish introducing this new daemon to humans to examine birds and receive rewards of sacrifices? If your hoary old age did not protect you, you would sit in the midst of the bacchants for introducing wicked rites. For where women have the delight of the grape at a feast, I say that none of their rites is healthy any longer. No! Oh, what impiety! Xenos. Don't you reverence the gods and Cadmos who sowed the earthborn crop? To you, the child of Echion disgraced your ancestry. Whenever a wise man takes a good occasion for his speech, it is not a great task to speak well. You have a fluent tongue as though you are sensible, but there is no sense in your words. A bold and powerful man, one capable of speaking well, becomes a worthless citizen if he lacks sense. Nor can I express how great this new God whom you scorn will be throughout Hellas. Two things, young man, have supremacy among humans. The goddess Demeter, she is the earth, but call her whatever name you wish, nourishes mortals with dry food. But he who came then, the offspring of Semele invented a rival, the wet drink of the grape and introduced it to mortals. It releases wretched mortals from their pains whenever they are filled with the stream of the vine and gives them sleep, a means of forgetting their daily woes. There is no other cure for pains. He himself, a god, is poured out in offering to the gods so that through him men have their good things. And do you laugh at him? Because he was sewn up in Zeus's thigh? I will teach you that this is well. When Zeus snatched him from the fire of lightning and led the child as a god to Olympus, Hera wished to banish him from the sky. Zeus devised a counter plan in a manner worthy of a god. Having broken a part of the air that surrounds the earth, he gave this to Hera as a pledge, protecting the real Dionysus from her quarreling. 
Mortals say that in time he was nourished in the thigh of Zeus because a god was hostage to the goddess Hera. By changing his name, they composed the story. But this daimon is a prophet for Bacchic revelry and madness have in them much prophetic skill. Whenever the god enters a body in full force, he makes the maddened tell the future. He also possesses some of the fate of Ares, for terror sometimes strikes an army under arms and in its ranks before it even touches a spear. This too is a frenzy from Dionysus. You will see him also on the rocks of Delphi, bounding with torches through the highland between the two peaks, leaping and shaking the Bacchic branch mighty throughout Hellas. But believe me, Pentheus, do not dare to claim that might has power among humans, nor think that you have any understanding at all, even if you believe so. Your mind is sick. Receive the God into your land, pour libations to him, celebrate the Bacchic rites and garland your head. Dionysus will not compel the women to be moderate in regard to Aphrodite, but it is right to look for this attribute in their natures. She who is naturally balanced will not be corrupted in Bacchic revelry. Do you see? You rejoice whenever many people are at your gates and the city extols the name of Pentheus. He too, I think, delights in receiving honors. Cadmus, whom you mock, and I will crown our heads with ivy and dance. <laughs> A hoary yoke team. Still, we must join the chorus. I will not be persuaded by your words to fight with the gods. You are mad in a most grievous way and you will not be cured by drugs, though your illness is surely due to drugs. Old man, you do not shame Phoebus with your words. By giving honours to Dionysus, a great god, you are balanced. Pentheus is persuaded by none of this, and the chorus sings of his impiety and their own piety, returning to this very same mesmerizing ionic rhythm accompanied by the tympanum. Hosia popna te on, hosia ta 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 gan, krusei tergi pere, ta de penthos aies, aies su gosian, Hubrines ton bromion ton semelas ton parakali Stephanus sel prosunais dai monoproton macaron. After the chorus sings another hymn to Dionysus and situates us in his mysterious power and his majesty, the play moves to a very different type of scene. One of the challenging things about the performance and the interpretation of this play is how it moves from sort of deep referential hymns to Dionysus to nearly slapstick scenes of action on the stage. We just witnessed Pentheus with his grandfather and uh, the blind uh, prophet Tiresias arguing about the god. And then we move to the next scene where Pentheus has triumphantly caught a stranger and the stranger is Dionysus in disguise. And when the audience know it's Dionysus, but Pentheus thinks it's a stranger. And this scene is probably central to the characterization of both Dionysus and Pentheus in the play. First, tell me what is your ancestry? I can tell you this easily without boasting. I suppose you are familiar with flowery Tmolos. I know of it, it's around the city of Sardis. I am from there. And Lydia is my fatherland. Why did you bring these rites to Hellas? Dionysus, the child of Zeus, persuaded us. Is there a Zeus who begets new gods there? No. But Zeus, who married Semele here. Did he bring you under his spell at night or in your sight? Seeing me just as I saw him gave me, he gave me sacred rites. What form do your rites have? They cannot be told to mortals, uninitiated in the Bacchic revelry. Well, how do they benefit those who participate? It is not right for you to hear, but they are, they are worth knowing. You've coined this story well, so that I desire to hear. The rites are hostile to whoever practices impiety. Are you saying that you saw clearly what the god was like? 
He was whatever sort he wanted be. I did not order this. You contrived this well, also, through speaking mere nonsense. One will seem to be foolish if he speaks wise things to a senseless man. Did you come here first with this daemon? All the barbarians celebrate these rites. Certainly, for their minds are far worse than the Hellenes. Better in this, at any rate. But their laws are different. Do you perform the sacred rites by night or by day? Mostly by night. Darkness conveys all. This is treacherous towards women and unsound. Even during the day you can find what is shameful. You must pay the penalty for your evil devices. And you for your ignorance and impiety toward the god. How bold and practised in speaking the bacchant is. Tell me what I must suffer. What terrible thing will you do to me? First, I will cut off your luxuriant hair. My hair is sacred. I am growing it for the god. Next, give me this sacred wand from your hands. Take it from me yourself. I bear it as the emblem of Dionysus. We will keep you in prison. Daemon himself will release me whenever I want. When you call him, that is, standing among the back eye. Even now he sees from close up what I suffer. Where is he? He's not visible to my eyes. Near me. But you, being impious, do not see him. Seize him, he insults me and Thebes. I warn you not to bind me, since I am balanced and you are not. And I, more powerful than you, bid them to bind you. You do not know how you live, or what you are doing, or who you are. I am Pentheus, son of Echion and Agave. You are well suited to be miserable in your name. Go! Shut him up near the horse stable so that he may see only darkness. Join the chorus there. These women whom you have led here as accomplices to your evils, we will either sell or, stopping them from making this noise and beating leather skins, make slaves for our looms. I will go, since I need not suffer that which is not necessary. But Dionysus, who you claim does not exist, will pursue you for this outrage. For in treating us without justice, you are leading him into chains. The chorus is shocked at the capture of their leader, and they respond yet again, very unusually in Greek tragedy, with the same kind of meter for the third song in a row, once again in Ionics, pleading to be accepted, along with the worship of Dionysus in Thebes. Poniel parten dirka, sugaren size pot of hard guys, totios prepos ella bes, hot a me roy puros ex artana tus daus, hot a con air passenin tadana boasas, iti diti ram beman arsenatan de batine dun, and a pino set on all banki a te bas on a mas As the chorus sings, the palace comes crashing to the ground. Dionysus' power has been activated, and the scene moves outside the palace. Again, central to the scene is the actor playing Dionysus, or Dionysus playing himself, and Pentheus. And central to their engagement is the activation of what is at the core of Dionysus, which is the relationship between desire and fear and madness. And Dionysus has planted the seeds of desire in the scene before. And now, as a messenger explains that the Bacchants are in the hills, uh, he elicits a different response, or let's say an exceptional response now from Pentheus as the scene continues with the chorus, Pentheus and Dionysus again. I fear to speak freely to the tyrants but I will speak, nevertheless. Dionysus is inferior to none of the gods. Already like fire does this outrage of the Bacchae blaze up, a great source of reproach for, like, for the Hellenes, but we must not hes hesitate. Go to the gates of Electra, bid all the shield bearers uh, and riders of swift horses to assemble, as well as all who brandish the light shield and pluck bowstrings with their hands so that we may make an assault against the Bacchae, for it is all too much if we suffer what we are suffering at the hands of women. 
Pentheus, though you hear my words, you, you obey not at all. I say that it is not right for me to suffer at your hands and for you to raise arms against me, the god. You must be serene instead. Romeos will not allow you to remove the Bacchae from the joyful mountains. Do not instruct me, but be content in your escape from prison. Or shall I bring punishment upon you again? As a mortal, I would sacrifice to the god rather than kick against the goads in anger. I will sacrifice, slaughtering the women as they deserve in the glens of Kitheron. You will all flee. And it will be the source of shame that you turn your bronze shields in flight from the sacred ones of the Bacchae. This Xenos with whom we are wrestling is impossible and will be, will be quiet, neither suffering nor acting. Friends, you can still settle this situation satisfactorily. Doing what? By being a slave to my servants? Without arms, I will bring the women here. Alas, you're contriving this as a trick against me. What sort of trick is it if I wish to save you? You have conspired in common so that you may have your revelry forever. I certainly did, with the god, that is. Yeah, bring me my armour and you keep quiet. Wait, do you wish to see the women sitting in the mountains? Certainly. I pay an enormous amount of gold to see them. Why do you want this so badly? I would be sorry to see them in their drunkenness. But... Would you see gladly what is grievous to you? To be sure, sitting quietly under the pines. But they will track you down even if you go in secret. You are right. I will go openly. Shall I guide you? Will you attempt the journey? Leave me as quickly as possible. I grudge you the time. Put clothes of eastern linen on your body then. What is this? Shall I then, instead of man, be reckoned among the women? so that they don't kill you if you appear there as a man. Again you speak correctly. How wise you have been all along. Dionysus gave me this education. How can these things which you advise me so well be done? I will go inside and dress you. In what clothing? Female. But shame holds me back. Are you no longer eager to view the Menads? What attire do you bid me to put on my body? I will spread out your hair at length on your head. What is the second part of my outfit? A robe down to your feet, and you will wear a headband. And what else will you add to this for me? A sacred wand in your hand and dappled fawn skin. I cannot possibly put on a woman's dress. But you will shed blood if you join battle with the Bacchae. True. We must go first and spy. This is more wise than hunting trouble with trouble. How will I go through the city without being seen by the Thebans? We will go on deserted roads. I will lead you. Anything is better than to be mocked by the Bacchae. Let's to go into the house and I will consider what seems best. We can do what we like. I am at your service for anything. I will go in. For I will either go bearing arms, or I will obey your guidance. Women, the man is caught in our net. He will reach the back eye where he will pay the penalty with his death. Dionysus, now it is your task. You are not far off. Let us punish him. First, drive him out of his mind. Send upon him a dizzying madness, since, is he, since if he is of sound mind, he will not consent to wear women's clothing, but he will put it on in insanity. I want him to be a source of laughter to the Thebans, led through the city in women's guise after making such terrible threats in the past. I'm going now. The costume that he will take with him to the house of Hades, when he goes off to that place, slaughtered by the two hands of his own mother. That costume will I attach to Pentheus, and he will come to know the son of Zeus, Dionysus, the one who by his own nature a god in the end, the one who is most terrifying, but for humans also most gentle. Shall I ever, in choruses that last all night long, Set in motion my gleaming white foot, 
in a bacchic revel as I thrust my throat toward the upper air, wet with dew. Yes, thrusting it forward just like a fawn, playfully skipping around in the green delights of a meadow after she has escaped from the terrifying hunt. Now she is out of reach, having leapt beyond their hunting nets, even while the hunter keeps shouting his hunting cry to his hounds, urging them to run faster and faster. But the fawn, like a gust of wind with the vigor of her swift running, is now bounding past the meadow that has the river next to it. And she can take sweet delight in the absence of mortal men, amidst the tender shoots growing in the forest with its shady leaves. What is wisdom? Or what finer prize do the gods give to mortals than to hold one's hand in victory over the head of one's enemy? Whatever is beautiful is near and dear forever. Divine strength is roused with difficulty but is trustworthy nevertheless. It chastises those mortals who give honours to folly and those who in their insanity do not extol the gods. The gods cunningly conceal the slow of time and hunt out the impious. One must not think or practise anything greater than the laws. It costs little to reckon that whatever involves a daimon has power and that whatever has long been lawful is eternally and naturally so. What is wisdom? Or what finer prize do the gods give to mortals than to hold one's hand in victory over the head of one's enemy? Whatever is beautiful is near and dear forever. Fortunate is he who has fled a storm on the sea and reached harbour. Fortunate too is he who has overcome his toils. Different people surpass others in various, various ways, be it in wealth or in power. Mortals have innumerable hopes and some come to their end in prosperity while others fail. I deem him blessed who life is fortunate day by day. You there. Yes, I'm talking to you, to the one who is so eager to see things that should not be seen and who rushes to accomplish things that cannot be rushed. It is you that I am talking to, Pentheus. Come out from inside the palace. Let me have a good look at you wearing the costume of a woman who is a meanad, a bacchant, ready to spy on your mother and her company. The way you are shaped, you look like you look just like one of the daughters of Cadmos. What is this? I think I see two sons and not one seven-gated city of Thebes, but two. And you, as you are leading me, you look like a, a bull and horns seem to have sprouted on your head. Were you ever before a beast? You have certainly now become a bull. The god accompanies us. Though formerly he was not of good intentions, he has a truce with us, and now you see what you should be seeing. So what do I appear to be? Do I not have the dancing pose of Aino or Agave, my mother? Looking at you, I think I see them right now. Oh, but watch out. This lock of hair here is out of place. It stands out, not the way I had secured it to be held down by the headband. While I was inside, I was shaking it backwards and forwards, and in a backache state of mind, I displaced it, moving it out of place. Then I, whose concern it is to care for you, will arrange it all over again. Come on, hold your head straight. You see it? There it is. You arrange it for me. I can see I am really depending on you. And your waistband has come loose. And those things are not in the right order. I mean, the pleats of your robe, the way they extend down around your ankles. Well, that's the way I see it from my angle as well. Mm -hmm. At least that is the way it is around my right foot. On this other side, the robe extends in a straight line down around the calf. I really do think you will consider me the foremost among those who are near and dear to you when, contrary to your expectations, you see that backhands are balanced. 
So which one will it be? I, I mean, shall I hold the sacred um, wand with my right hand or, or with this other one here? Which is the way I will look more like a bacchant? You must hold it in your right hand and at the same time with your right foot, you must make an upward motion. I approve of the way you have shifted in your thinking. Could I not carry on my shoulders the ridges of Mad Kitheron, Bacchants and all? You could if you wanted to. Your earlier thoughts were not sound, but now they are the way they should be. Shall we bring levers? Or shall I use my hands for lifting, throwing a shoulder or arm underneath the mountains as I raise them up? But you must not destroy the dwelling place of the nymphs and the places where Pan stays playing on his pipe. You said it well. It is not by force that my victory over the women should happen. I will hide my body under the shelter of the fir trees. You will hide yourself by hiding as you should be hidden, coming as a crafty spy on the Minos. You know, I have this vision of them. There they are in the bushes, like birds in their most beloved hiding places, held tight in the grip of making love. Yes, and are you not like a guardian who has been sent out to counter exactly this kind of thing? Perhaps you will catch them unless they beat you to it and you yourself get caught. Bring me there, let us go there, passing right through the middle of Thebes on our way. I am the only one of the Thebans who dare dress like this. You alone enter the struggle for the sake of this city. You alone. And so the ordeals that must happen are awaiting you. Follow me. I'm your guide giving salvation, but then on the way back, someone else will lead you down from up there. Yes, it will be my mother. And you will be a distinctive sign to all. I am going with that objective in mind. You will return here being carried. You are talking about my desire for luxury. In the arms of your mother. Yes, indeed. In such luxury. I am reaching for things I deserve. I am undertaking worthy deeds. A man of terror you are. A man of terror. And you are going after experiences that are things of terror. The result will be that you will find a glory reaching all the way up to the sky. Hold out your hands, Agarwe, and you too, her sisters, daughters of Cadmus. The young man is being led by me to this great ordeal here. And the one who will win the victory, that will be I myself. Bromios and I myself will be the victors. What signals it are other things that are yet to happen. The chorus now makes a very profound musical move. Instead of singing these steady, mesmerizing ionics they've been singing, they move to the most frenetic rhythm of Greek poetry, the Dothmiacs, as they sing about how they are now going to get Dionysus. Go to the mountains, go, fleet hounds of madness, where the daughters of Cadmos hold their company and goad them against the mad spy on the Menads the one dressed in woman's garb. His mother first will see him from a smooth rock or crag as he lies in ambush, and she will cry out to the Menads. Who is this speaker of the mountain going, Cadmians? Who has come to the mountain, to the mountain, Bacchae? Who bore him? For he was not born from a woman's blood, but is the offspring of some lioness or of Libyan gorgons. Let manifest justice go forth. Let it go with sword in hand. Slay with a blow through the throat of this godless, lawless, unjust, earth-born offspring of Echion. He with wicked plan and unjust disposition regarding your rights, Bacchus, and those of your mother comes with raving heart and mad disposition to overcome by force what is invincible. 
The balance for his purposes is death that accepts no excuses when the affairs of the gods are concerned. To act like a mortal, this is a life that's free from pain. I do not envy the wise, but rejoice in seeking it. But other things are great and manifest. Oh, that life might flow towards the good, cultivating pure and pious things day and night, giving honours to the gods, banishing customs outside of justice. Let manifest justice go forth. Let it go with sword in hand. Slay with a blow through the throat this godless, lawless, unjust, earth-born offspring of Echion. Reveal yourself as a bull or many-headed serpent or raging lion in appearance. Go, Bacchus, with smiling face throw a deadly noose round the neck of this hunter of the Bacchae as he falls beneath a flock of Minads. Asian Bacchae. Why do you urge me? We bring home from the mountain a freshly cut tendril. Blessed prey. I see it and will accept you as a fellow member of the procession. I caught this young wild cub without snares, as you can see. From what wilderness? Catheron. Catheron? Slew him. Who is she who struck him? The prize is mine first. I am called Agave by the worshippers. Who else? Cadmus's other. Cadmus is what? And other offspring lay hold of this beast after me. This is a lucky catch. Share in the feast then. What? I share in the feast, wretched woman. The bull is young. He has just recently grown a downy cheek under the crest of his hair. Yes, his hair looks like a wild beast's. Bacchus, a wise huntsman, wisely set the Menads against this beast. Our lord is a hunter. Do you approve of this? I do. Soon the Cadmians and your son Pentheus too will praise his will praise his mother who has caught this lion-like catch. Extraordinary. And extraordinarily caught. Are you proud? I am delighted, for I have performed great conspicuous deeds on this hunt. Now show the citizens, wretched woman, the prize which you have brought in victory. You who dwell in this fair towered city of the Theban land, come to see which we, the daughters of Cadmus, hunted down, not with thonged Thessalian javelins or with nets, but with the white armed edges of our hands. Should huntsmen boast when they use in vain the work of smear spear makers, we call tore apart the limbs of this beast with our very own hands. Where is my old father? Let him approach. Where is son Pentheus? Let him raise a ladder against the house so that he can ascend and affix to the triglyphs this lion's head, which I have captured and brought back. Follow me, carrying the miserable burden of Pentheus. Follow me, attendants, before the house. There I am bringing this body of his. Exhaust countless searches, for I discovered it torn apart in the folds of Kitharum. I picked up nothing in the same place, and it was lying in the woods where discovery was difficult. I heard of my daughter's bold deeds when I had already come within the walls of the city on my return from the Bacchae with old Tiresias. I turned back to the mountain. Oh, bring back the child who was killed by the Menads. 
I saw a Tonai who once bore Ation and Aristus and Eno with her, both in the thickets, still mad, wretched creatures. But someone told me that Agave was coming here with Bacchic foot, and this was correct, for I see her. Not a happy sight. Mother, you may boast a great boast that you have sired daughters, the best by far of all mortals. I mean all of them, but myself in particular, who have left my shuttle at the loom and gone on to bigger things to catch wild animals with my two hands. I carry the trophy of these noble feats in my arms, so that it may hang from your house. And you, father, receive it in your hands, preening yourself in my catch. Summon your near and dear ones to a feast, for you are blessed, blessed indeed, now that I have done these deeds. Oh, Pensos, beyond measuring, one which I cannot stand to see, since you have committed murder with your miserable hands, having cast down a sacrificial victim to the demonize, you invite Thebes and me to a banquet. Alas, woes, and then for my own. With justice, yet too severely, Lord Bromius has destroyed us, though he is a member of our own family. How morose and sullen in its countenance is man's old age. Son is a good hunter, taking after his mother when he goes after wild beasts together with young men of Thebes. But all he can do is fight with the gods. You must admonish him, father. Who will call him here to my sight so that he may see how happy I am? Alas, alas, when you realize where well, he will suffer a terrible pain. But if you remain, Time and again in the state you are in now, though hardly fortunate, you will not imagine that you have encountered disaster. But what of these matters is not good? Or what is painful? First, your eye to the sky. Well, why did you tell me to look at it? Is it still the same, or does it appear to have changed? It is brighter than before and more translucent. Is your spirit still quivering? I don't understand your utterance, for I have become somehow sobered, changing from my former thoughts. Can you hear and respond clearly? How I forgot what I said before, Father. To whose house did you come in marriage? You gave me, as they say, to Echion, one of the Spartoi. What son did you bear to your husband in the house? Pentheus, from my union with his father. Whose head do you hold in your as they who hunted him down said. Examine it correctly then. It takes but effort to see. Ah, alas, what do I see? What is this that I carry in my hands? Look at it and learn more clearly. Be the greatest pain, wretched that I am. Does it look at all like a lion? No, but I, wretched, hold the head of Pentheus. Mourned by me before you recognized him. Who killed him? How did he cut my hands? Miserable truth. How inopportunely you arrived. Tell me. My heart leaps awaiting what is to come. You and your sisters killed him. Where did he die? Was it here at home or in what place? where formerly dogs divided Actaeon amongst And why did this miserable man go to Cytheron? He went to mock the god and your revelry. But in what way did we go there? You were mad, and the whole city was frantic with Bacchus. Dionysus destroyed us, now I understand. He was wronged with outrage. You did not consider him a god. And where is the most near and dear body of my child, father? I have tracked it with difficulty and brought it back. Are its joints laid properly together? What part had Pantheus in my folly? He who did not revere the god, who therefore joined all in one ruin, both you and this one here, and thus destroyed the house and me. 
I did not beget male children, and I see this often womb, wretched woman, most miserably and disgracefully slain. He was the hope of our line, you, child, who supported the house, son of my daughter, an object of fearful reverence for the city. Seeing you, no one wished to treat you with outrage, for you would have taken fitting justice. But now I, great Cadmus, who sowed and reaped a most beautiful crop, the Theban people, will be banished from the house without honours, most near and dear of men. Though you are dead, I still count you among my most near and dear child. No longer embrace and embrace me. Your mother's father touching my chin with your hand and saying, who treats you without justice, without honours, old man? Who vexes the heart? Tell me, father, so I can punish the one who does you wrong. And now I am miserable while you are wretched. Mother pitiful and your relatives wretched. If anyone scores, scores the daimones, let them look into the death of this man and acknowledge them. I grieve for you, Cadmus. Your daughter's child has the justice he deserved, that it is grievous to you. Father, you see how much my situation has turned around. Changing your form, you will become a dragon. And your wife, Harmonia, Ares' daughter, whom you, though mortal, took in marriage, will be turned into a beast and will receive in exchange the form of a serpent. And as the oracle of Zeus says, you will drive along with your wife a pair of heifers, ruling over barbarians. You will sack many cities with a force of countless numbers. And when they plunder the oracle of Apollo, they will have a miserable return, but Ares will protect you and Harmonia and will settle your life in the land of the blessed. So say I, Dionysus, born not from a mortal father, but from Zeus. If you had known how to be balanced when you did not wish to, you would have acquired Zeus's offspring as an ally and would now be fortunate. Dionysus, we beseech you. We have acted with anger. You have learned it too late. You did not know it when you should have. Now we know, but you go too far us. I, a god by birth, was insulted by your outrage. God should not resemble mortals in their anger. My father Zeus decreed this long ago. Alas, a miserable exile has been decreed for us, old man. Why then do you delay what must necessarily be? Child, what a terrible misery has befallen us, you, your brothers and sisters and wretched me. I shall go as an aged immigrant. Still it is foretold that I shall bring into Hellas a motley barbarian army. I, leading their spears, endowed with of a serpent, will lead my wife Harmonia, daughter of Ares, against the altars and tombs of Hellas. I will neither rest from my evils in my misery, nor will I sail over the downward flowing Acheron and be at peace. I will go into exile deprived of you. Why do you embrace me with your hands, child, like a white swan does its exhausted parent? Where can I turn, banished from my land? Farewell, home. Farewell, city of my forefathers. In misfortune I leave you. Bedchamber. Go now, child, to the land of Aristiles. I bemoan you, father. And I you, child. And I weep for your sisters. Terribly indeed has Lord Dionysus brought this suffering to your home. I suffered, ter I suffered terrible things at your hands. 
and my name was not given honours in Thebes. Farewell, my father. Farewell, unhappy daughter. With difficulty indeed, when you reach this faring well. Lead me escorts, where I may take comfort in as companions to my exile. May I go where a cursed Kitheron may not see me, nor I see Kitheron with my eyes, nor where a memorial of a Bacchid, Bacchid sacred wand has been dedicated. Let these come. Many are the forms of things of the Daimones, and the gods bring many things to pass unexpectedly. What is expected does not come to fulfilment, and a god finds a way for the unexpected. So too has this affair turned out. Ending with those words, which may not have actually been the real ending of the Bacchae, were left in a place that I like to think of as nothing but confusion. Uh, to use non-profanity to explain my typical response to the end of the Bacchae. One of the things I found in teaching and reading it is that in each performance I observe of the play, I get a little something more out of it and I understand it more. Uh, for me, uh, problems that persist are understanding the character Pentheus and then understanding at the end why Cadmus and Agave have to be punished and what role Pentheus played in this. But Tim, I was hoping you could talk to us a little more about what else we miss by not being part of the performative context, right? What are other aspects of the music and the dance and the costumes that may help us understand what it is to be an audience to this play and what this play means um, to ancient audiences? Yes, I think there's a lot we can think about. And in fact, this format is especially useful for that, isn't it? Because we are forced away from what we take for granted when we usually go and see a play today, which opens up the mind to think about all the things that in fact we miss not sitting in the theater of Dionysus in the late fifth century to watch this play. First of all, we're not in the big, huge outdoor space of the theater of Dionysus which would create a great feeling of community among all there. We're not sitting uh, in the sacred space for Dionysus, which makes everything else have special significance as we go on here. Uh, we don't have the orchestra with the dancing going on, which we have to think not only the sound, but the dancing is happening throughout these chorus, that each one of these are very lively events. The actors wearing masks creates a whole ritualistic experience to this. And then add to that the music with the kinds of patterns that I've been talking about. And we can see that the performance elements reinforce the confusion that you mentioned. People have been trying to draw nice lessons from the Bacchae for centuries, saying, well, it means we shouldn't be overcome by too much religion, or we have to give way to our irrational element and making it an easy answer. And I think we could see from our production today and the, re the, the performance elements in the fifth century would reinforce even more that there is no easy answer here. That makes this play especially a fine one for our time today when we don't have any easy answers coming up in the next weeks. Uh, we could easily say, well, Pentheus is just stupid and doesn't give in to his irrationality and therefore he's doomed. But then when we look at the terror that happens to Abgavi and especially Cadmus, we can see that it's not nearly as easy as that. We're faced when we come to these forces we don't understand with things that are far, far beyond our comprehension. So, and I think one of the amazing things about the genre of tragedy is how many different people are involved in the interpretation of the words and the moments, right? So a few weeks ago, we were talking about that platonic metaphor of the magnet. And the magnet is the original source of inspiration, the divine force. And then the poet is the next link in the chain that gives its power. Then the performer is there before the audience. So one of the amazing things about in, being an actor in ancient Greece and now and a director is that you're literary, literally an intermediary between the source and the interpretation. So I, I'd like to bring the actors in here for some of the questions. I'll, I'll aim at the chorus first. And one of the choruses, um, uh, yeah, you, you, 
you can just say you don't know, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but for both of you, um, one of the lines that's repeated, which doesn't happen that often in tragedy, um, you mm -hmm. sang. Um, and what, what you uh, said repeatedly was, what is wisdom? And this line is interesting um, because it's not the abstract that you get like with Plato, with Sophia. It's Tita Sophon, right? Which could be like, what's a wise thing? What's a stratagem? What's a moment of cleverness? And in the, mo in the course of that course, what did you feel was going on? What were some of the messages or tones you felt you were conveying? And I'll take whichever one of you would like to go first. <laughs> okay. Go on then, Nicole. <laughs> I'm just, go on over to you Sarah um well I think I, I think that of course they are asking those big questions um and I think Tim just pointed out uh that sense of what is rational what is irrational and all those things um and the contrast between um your uh, common sense mind or your rational mind and yeah it's just as asking that big question but I'm not sure how much to add to that at this moment. <laughs> I think um, I think they're interesting the chorus because at the one point they're um, they sort clearly acolytes of, of Dionysus and, um, and praying to him but at the same time there's that kind of questioning and I think they later on they sort of they almost pity agave but I, I wonder whether this is the, the beginnings of that, that that kind of questioning i don't know okay um tony you get the i don't know if it's desirable um or undesirable job of being dionysus and i don't know if any of us can imagine what that's like um but to go on with this wisdom scene or the contagion theme that i was talking about the well, part of what the play really conceptualizes at times is who's in their right mind and what that even means. That several times we talk about your mind being sick. Um, uh, the characters claim on the stage, we alone are right-minded, everybody else is wrong. How did you see the force of Dionysus in the play as both you know, a character, um, but also as an actor and sort of exploring perspectives? Uh, it's interesting because he makes he actually makes a very sensible argument for like for Pentheus to go in disguise, but then says, I must make him mad for him to actually put on the clothes um, when he's actually given him a logical reason to put on the clothes, but then goes, no, I will still resort to my, my, my strength. It seems like a big part of his power is to drive people out of their noggin, out of their minds, um, which I thought was really interesting because he's, I suppose on that level of a worship of gods, um, there is something magical, there is something mysterious, there is something otherworldly about it. And we often interpret that, we can often interpret those things as, as madness. We see people um, sometimes in uh, religious fits of, you know, whatever it is being possessed by certain things otherworldly so it enhances his i suppose it's something he would use if he's as he is trying to prove that he is a god that he should be worshipped as a god and to attack someone's mind is probably one of the most powerful things you can do um as an as an actor playing him it's really cool he's the big g's you know <laughs> it's uh, He's a big man. I got to play Agamemnon once at drama school. So all the big Greek guys are kind of fun to play. You know, they're all, they're very, they're very powerful. They're very big. They're very, you know, I've got a big beard. Come on, let's go. Um, so yeah, it was fun. It was well, fun. And I, I like that you bring that up because that sort of meta theatricality of Dionysus really um, prefaces or foretells the later clever slave motif that is important in new comedy, but also we see it like in Moliere, Moliere and other plays where you have someone sort of stage managing the entire thing. But there's a menace to it with Dionysus that I find, um, well, it's menacing, first of all. It is, it is very menacing. I mean, all, all, of, those, all of those stories, um, whenever it comes down to dealing with the gods, 
as with a lot of, I mean, I, I haven't come across a God story that feels very benevolent and kind and, and yeah. nice. You know, most, yeah. most God stories, whatever their iteration, they have the ability to be really angry and pissed off yeah. and to make the normal people suffer hugely, hugely. Yeah. But um, so we don't see that, I don't think, replicated as much in the kind of stage management roles or guiding people through roles in modern day plays. That's but right. certainly in older versions, nuts, power hungry, power crazy. Right, and there's something about the clever slave motif that doesn't, uh, that doesn't carry over as well into sort of uh, divine vengeance. Um, so a question we have from YouTube, um, centers around the engagement between Pentheus and Dionysus. And there's that, you know, one of, I think, the most amazing scenes from ancient Greek tragedy is uh, when Dionysus convinces Pentheus to cross-dress, right? And it's a weird staging because Pentheus is one way, then it's like something changes and he's very different. So there's a theme of androgyny going there that I think we could talk about from a mythical perspective. But when you two were thinking about this scene and just the words, um, how did you take it? How did it guide you? Um, Richard, you really changed physically in your expressions. Um, how, how did you move into that role? And what is, do you think the theme of androgyny is doing? Um, I, 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 I see, uh, uh, it is androgyny, I suppose, but I, I kind of see it more as, um, as a theme of desire and that it's the desire that transcends mm. gender in a, in a way. So, I just, his language in, in this changes so much really quickly. And there's the curiosity that everything is different and everything has changed. And I find it incredible. Um, and I've seen the back eye, I think, I think I've seen about nine different productions of the back eye. And I always find it incredible when Pentheus comes out and just by changing his clothes, he is changed. Um, and there is, an incredible sexual charge to it, I think, as well of of, of desire and and and, and longing, um, and I wonder rather than it being about androgyny, but it, it, I mean it is, but rather than it being about androgyny, it's about a a freedom of desire, a a social release being lifted <laughs> by presentment of self or or by 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 a change, and that's what I got from the words of Pentheus. I was. I, I like that because I, I mean the androgyny is there, but I think that's I do think that that's more a feature of uh, the sexual boundaries and expectation of ancient Greece and our own time, which are primarily heteronormative when we approach this play. Right? Absolutely, and I think a couple, uh, definitely the last um, Bacchae I saw, Dionysus was a, was very non-binary. I mean, you wouldn't have you, you know it was Ben Whishaw, but it, you you were kind of unsure actually yeah. is this is this a very fey man or is this a woman or is this what what, what traits are being shown here and actually in actual fact what, what you took away from it was was the trait of of comfort that everyone found something in Dionysus to to be comforted by to be led by to be attracted by whether and, and I and I thought that that transcendence of gender was is, is quite fascinating. In, in and I think a, I think a powerful way, to, as you put it, is that desire itself becomes a great leveling, if not humanizing force. And it takes us to a, a, a question I wanted to to open up to sort of everyone, um, which is that this play really pushes against the boundaries of divine will and fate and what humans can get out of it. And there's this line in one of the choruses um, where it says in Greek, right? to live a life of a mortal or to live as a mortal is a life free of pain, which really goes against the grain of what's happening in the play. But repeatedly we hear things in the play that you know the person who lives fortunately is the one who lives day by day, right? Who takes the pleasure that you can give. And, I wonder if this is another place where we could find some common ground between our current experience and Euripides. So to go back to Tim, right, the performance of this play is in a community that's been under siege for 25 years, 
right? That has been at war, that has lost tens of thousands of people at war and has experienced plagues. And so there's something in this movement of this, you know, the desirableness of desire that allows us to live in the moment of being human. So did you guys see that in the play, especially chorus? Did you feel that tension between the chorus and the uh, action? Or isn't there action? also a moment, isn't there also a moment where they talk about wine and humans having wine makes things better as well? Right. <laughs> I think I think that's very appropriate today. Very right. appropriate. There we go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> any other comments on that theme? So the living for the carpe diem theme that seems to be there? Is that just on the surface or do you think that's a core part? What do you think, Tim? I think very much that goes along with the, the sense of being out, of being outside, which again is very relevant to us when we're cooped up. Uh, going back to the gender issue and the androgyny, much of what is going on here is the, the awareness on the part of the audience that if you're an upper class Athenian woman, you're supposed to be where Gavi says she was before at the loom kept mostly inside the house. And there's this great release of being outside. And when he becomes like a woman, Pentheus virtually joins that, the woman outside of the bounds she's supposed to be in. So I think that kind of desire along with the general sees life while we can is much of what's going on here. Um, so, but back to the thing, so the tension between the boundaries that we have to exist within and our desire to transcend them, um, I think sort of a central question is what happens to Agave and Cadmus? And I'd like to bring those actors in. I'm sorry that I've been ignoring you two. Um, yeah. I know Me you're too. still there. Um, I think a central interpretive problem to the play is why does Agave suffer? Um, and there's a kind of easy answer to that. But then why does Cadmus suffer too? When you two were reading these parts, um, what did you think about sort of the responsibility and fate of your characters? Well, I, I felt that Cadmus, I, I agree with Tim, I think it was said that you, you do wonder why he has to suffer so much. I mean, he, I think he says to a Dionysus at one time, uh, I think you've gone too far. And uh, it feels a bit like that, really. I mean, I'm not quite sure what Cadmus is, well, Cadmus. apart from having bred, bred the, the, the uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what his, his, um, his, his sin is really. Well, he also, he says, what does he say? That you shouldn't, God should not their anger. Yeah. I mean, he puts him, he's, 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 I, a God by birth was insulted by your outrage, but he's behaved. He's suggesting he hasn't behaved. He's, he's, his, his bad temper, his, his lack of control is more mortal. Yeah, I think, and there's that opening scene where we have to wonder how serious Cadmus is um, yeah. in his belief. And that, that sort of challenges it um, and sort of pushes on the boundaries. Um, so over the past few weeks, as we've been doing these, we've been talking a bit about the experience of performing a play or reading it um, in this type of context. Um, so I, I'd like to then start by talking to the actors and asking you how, how you experienced it and what you thought of this. Um, so let's start with the chorus again um, and then move, move out. Um, I, I found it very interesting to read a play that uh, whose most joyful passages are about being outside and running yeah. uh, about uh, the, the, the description of the fawn having escaped the hunters and running about free uh, is something that's um, very dear to us at the moment because we can't do that. But uh, I think members of the chorus, I think that's one of the reasons why Dionysus is so attractive. Is it's about the outside and it's about freedom and, and nature. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, that for me, um, as we've referred to, um, the undeniable exuberance and joy of being part of a big community and um, of, of um, telling a story as part of a, of a group and not just the, those that are telling the story, but those that are listening to the story as well. And just the immediacy of having everyone in one space and performing it, there, there is an, um, an undeniable joy to that. 
Um, but I think that um, this story has obviously survived for a very long time and it will continue to do so in this format or another and um, that there's there's a joy in um, in meeting you all and um, being able to tell this story and, and keep keep it alive and obviously the themes within it are relevant to today um, and that sense of what do we if d d if you deny someone's liberation what um, what's the consequence of that and I think that's I think that's that's what um, I've taken away from this today and um, yeah it's been really great to, to read it in this way but also to reflect on how it sh how it, it would have been or how how it could be as well thank you Nicole T Tony Dionysus himself um, what did you think of the both constraints and also the aspects of liberation of this context it's interesting I mean it's, it's very interesting to hear um, especially some of the things Tim was doing because you don't often get that level of expertise when you're when you're, you know, um, discussing anything uh, or, or any play. I have to say, having been um, for three or four weeks without um, a, a format to perform, there's the very needy actor in me who just adored being able to speak on, a, you know, any uh, piece of script whatsoever, you know, because quite frankly, there's a little, you know, ego monkey inside of me that was just yearning for a bit of performance, a bit of performance. So thank you very, very much um, to everyone for allowing me to be a part of it because that was really helpful. It also though highlights how the, some of the best things I miss about doing what I do, which is contact, physical contact with other people. It's the air in the room is kind of important for a lot of these, for all plays, I think, for all words. The, con the, the communication between the people talking is important. And I wonder um, how much we lose in the case of, even though we can see people's faces, um, you know, you can't see two people directly looking at each other and communicating in that way. And there's so much to be brought to life, especially in these wonderful pieces, which involve huge groups of people to be able to see that is 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 a valuable and wonderful thing and obviously i'm suffering from withdrawal at the moment of not being able to be around a lot of that so it made me feel that even more palpably yeah. um but as you can tell i've you know I, I had a great time i really did and i hope uh, i hope to come back and be part of possibly um, um a few others in the future it would be great i love it thank you thank you um so uh janet and Vince, your experience yeah. was even one further step mediated from the rest of ours. You didn't get the yeah. visual. Uh, what was it like for you uh, to, to listen? And well, to we, it, 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 it was, yeah, it was, um, well, it's, it, was a, it was a strange experience. Because there was, um, I don't know if everybody else was getting this, but there was a delay often between lines, which was odd. It was, I mean, we had one another, so it wasn't like being completely, but it was completely on our own. But it was very, um, meeting strangers, I mean, communicating with strangers and in quite um, an intense way and all sharing in something and yet we couldn't see you was, um, it, it was quite concentrating actually, listening. It really, it was very focused. It was, uh, uh, and we also, we had to sort of just trust that you could actually even hear us. So it was, that was a really rather weird experience. You know, even as I'm speaking now, cause I can't see you, there's this delay. I don't even know if you can hear me now. And that's sort of, that's very, but enjoyable. It's been, <laughs> we've, yeah. It's, it's um it was I've really enjoyed listening to the people the other actors and very much listening to what you were saying it's it's uh, the, 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 about the play it's been it's been really uh, stimulating and it's been a fun evening I don't know yeah very much and um, I think uh, 
uh, the, the, the wisdom is at the end and, and the gods bring many things to pass unexpectedly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, Tim, I know that, you know, you've had lots of experience with these plays, uh, with the choruses, with the music. Um, what did you get out of this context and this type of performance that you hadn't seen or experienced before? What I think was most profound for me, Joel, is that for somebody who spends far too many of his waking hours trying to figure out what's lost, the music, the performance here, we don't have this when we watch a play, to see how much is still there and what in many ways is the far from ideal mode where we don't even have live actors together, to see what this text still accomplished, where I'm practically weeping at the end of the play, just like I would if I were watching it at any point. I thought that was pretty profound as to what Euripides has accomplished. Yeah. And then, I mean, I think that's a, a great comment to sort of near closing with about the classics is that we do lament how much we've lost all the time. And then we forget to acknowledge how precious it is that we have anything at all. Right. And, you know, maybe a little apocalyptic to think in such terms. And so I'll turn to Paul now for his reflections on this performance in comparison to the last ones. Um, well, I, again, I, I sort of really enjoyed it. I'm kind of really enjoying the things that we're discovering. And actually, I've, in a, felt in a way, there was something about the fact that sometimes there is a, a dodgy connection, say, and you're on a bit of a delay. And there is this sense of, of, of miscommunication that's going on. And then actually <laughs> kind of fits in really nicely with what is happening in the play. Because I feel that there's a lot of, a lot of the time, what's going on is we're trying to work out, what, you know, what are the rules now? And actually, there's this whole new sort of way of, of, of worshipping, say, that's come to the world in, in our play. And actually, so I'm, you know, so all these characters are trying to kind of get up to speed with that in a similar way to how it feels that we're trying to get up to speed with life generally and with technology generally. But actually, there were a lot of moments then when communication was sort of breaking a little bit, which felt like it was happening at the right time. That actually, yeah, we're just, we're kind of missing some, crucial little details here and there and I'm slightly misunderstanding you and of course for us and the characters in the play those the consequences of that become sort of severe in the extreme and I really really enjoyed the the sense of rhythm Tim that you kind of opened up to us that whole world and that idea of because obviously sort of sort of you know kind of in the back of your head that there is this ritual that's associated with all tragedy and this rhythm that would be associated with all tragedy, but it feels so much even more relevant to this particular tra tragedy, that there is this ritual. And it almost, it sort of felt like, um, it made me wonder kind of what, what do cults do when there is social distancing? And, you know, sort of, if you all have to go online to try and recruit everyone, <laughs> and that's sort of, how does, it, how does it all work? Because that's sort of, it feels what's going on, it's sort of within sort of the context of this actually, and the sort of the idea of this sort of, changing rhythms and pulses going on that you might sort of associate with with cults you know and when does a cult become a religion um and all that sort of thing so that those were kind of things that came out from from this particular one today there's probably a subreddit for cults if you want to look into that paul <laughs> uh, before before closing I, I i would be remiss not to acknowledge the people who are making this possible um keith Janet, Ellen, and Sarah, and Lana from the Cosmos Society and Center for Linux Studies. Would any of you like to um, talk about this performance? Um, all right, Ellen. The first, thank you all. That was really great. But I have a special thank for Timo, the team, um, because uh, the highlight of the date for me today was when you uh, read some passages of the chorus in Greek, in ancient Greek, because I think we don't hear enough of ancient Greek uh, nowadays. So that was really a great highlight of the day. Thank you so much, Tim. Yes, so Tim, thank you. And I think there will be some other, some more Greek integrated. We're gonna be creative, doing different things. I wanna thank all the actors um, for participating today um, and for sharing your wine and thoughts with us. Um, and I hope to see you in uh, future weeks. So thank you everybody for viewing. Um, we'll be here next week. Um, which play are we doing next week? I've already forgotten. Um, we're we're <laughs> going to do it. Alice. Alice. There you go. Um, same time. 
Yeah, same place. Everyone take care and stay well.